Chapter 1 Auburn Is squirm in my chair as soon as he tells me his hourly rate. There's no way I can afford this with my income. Do you work on a sliding scale basis? I ask him. He wrinkles around his mouth become more prominent as he attempts to keep from frowning. He folds his arms over the mahogany desk and clasps his hands together, pressing the pads of his thumbs against one other. Auburn, what you're asking me to do is going to cost money. No shit. He leans back in his chair, pulling his hands to his chest and resting them on his stomach. Lawyers are like weddings. You get what you pay. 4. I fail to tell him what a horrible analogy that is. Instead, I glance down at the business card in my hand. He came highly recommended and I knew it was going to be expensive, but I had no idea it would be this expensive. I'll need a second job. Maybe even a third one. Actually, I'm going to have to rob a damn bank. And there's no guarantee the judge will rule in my favor. The only promise I can make is that I'll do everything I can to ensure the judge does rule in your favor. According to the paperwork that was led back in Portland, you've put yourself in a tough spot. Is will take time. All I have is time, I mumble. I'll be back as soon as I get my RST paycheck. He has me set up an appointment through his secretary and then sends me on my way, back out into the Texas heat. I've been living here all of three weeks and so far it's everything I thought it would be, hot, humid, and lonely. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and assumed I would spend the rest of my life there. I visited Texas once when I was 15 and although that trip wasn't a pleasant one, I wouldn't take back a single second of it. Unlike now. When I'd do anything to get back to Portland. I pull my sunglasses down over my eyes and begin heading in the direction of my apartment. Living in downtown Dallas is nothing like living in downtown Portland. At least in Portland, I had access to almost everything the city had to offer, all within a decent walk. Dallas is spread out and expansive, and did I mention the heat? It's so hot. And I had to sell my car in order to afford the move, so I have the choice between public transportation and my feet, considering I'm now penny-pinching in order to be able to afford the lawyer I just met with. I can't believe it's come to this. I haven't even built up a clientele at the salon I'm working at, so I'm Denny Telly going to have to look for a second job. I just have no idea when I'll end time to tee it in, thanks to Lydia's erratic scheduling. Speaking of Lydia, I dial her number and hit send and wait for her to pick up on the other end. After it goes to voicemail, I debate whether to leave a message or just call back later tonight. I'm sure she just deletes her messages, anyway, so I end the call and drop the phone into my purse. I can feel the ush rising up my neck and cheeks and the familiar sting in my eyes. It's the 13th time I've walked home in my new state, in a city inhabited by nothing but strangers, but I'm determined to make it the RST time I'm not crying when I reach my front door. My neighbors probably think I'm psychotic. It's just such a long walk from work to home, and long walks make me contemplate my life, and my life makes me cry. I pause and look into the glass window of one of the buildings to check for smeared mascara. I take in my reach and, and don't like what I see. A girl who hates the choices she's made in her life. A girl who hates her career. A girl who misses Portland. A girl who desperately needs a second job, and now a girl who is reading. The help wanted sign she just noticed in the window. Help wanted. Knock to apply. I take a step back and assess the building I'm standing in front of, I've passed by it every day on my commute and I've never noticed it. Probably. 
because I spend my mornings on the phone and my afternoon walks with too many tears in my eyes to notice my surroundings. Confess. That's all the sign says. E name leads me to believe it might be a church. But that thought is quickly dismissed when I take a closer look at the glass. Windows lining the front of the building. EY are covered with small scraps. Of paper in various shapes and sizes, concealing views into the building. Removing any hope of taking a peek inside. E scraps of paper are all. Marked with words and phrases, written in different handwriting. I take a. Step closer and read a few of them. Every day I'm grateful that my husband and his brother look exactly alike. It means there's less of a chance that my husband will find out that our son isn't his. I clutch my hand to my heart. What the hell is this? I read another. I haven't spoken to my children in four months. They'll call on holidays and my birthday, but never in between. I don't blame them. I was a horrible father. I read another. I lied on my resume. I don't have a degree. In the five years I've been working for my employer, no one has ever asked to see it. My mouth is agape and my eyes are wide as I stand and read all the confessions my eyes can reach. I still have no idea what this building is or what I even think about all these things being plastered up for the world to see, but reading them somehow gives me a sense of normalcy. If these are all true, then maybe my life isn't quite as bad as I think it is. After no less than 15 minutes, I've made it to the second window. Having read most of the confessions to the right of the door, when it begins to swing open, I take a step back to avoid being hit, while I simultaneously GHT the intense urge to step around the door and get a peek inside the building. A hand reaches out and yanks down the help wanted sign. I can hear a marker sliding across the vinyl sign as I remain poised behind the door. Wanting to get a better look at whoever or whatever this place is, I begin to step around the door just as the hand slaps the help wanted sign back onto the window. Help wanted. Knock to apply. Desperately needed. Beat on the damn door. I laugh when I read the alterations made to the sign. Maybe this is fate. I. Desperately need a second job and whoever this is desperately needs help. E door then opens further, and I'm suddenly under the scrutiny of eyes. That I guarantee are more shades of green than I could nd on his paint splattered shirt. His hair is black and thick and he uses both hands to push it off his forehead, revealing even more of his face. His eyes are wide and full of anxiety at RST, but after taking me in, he lets out a sigh. It's almost as if he's acknowledging that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be and he's relieved I'm nally here. He stares at me with a concentrated expression for several seconds. Shift on my feet and glance away. Not because I'm uncomfortable, but because the way he stares at me is oddly comforting. It's probably the RST. Time I've felt welcome since I've been back in Texas. Are you here to save me? He asks, pulling my attention back to his eyes. He's smiling, holding the door open with his elbow. He assesses me from head to toe and I can't help but wonder what he's thinking. I glance at the help wanted sign and run through a million scenarios of what could happen if I answer his question with a yes and follow him inside this building. The worst scenario I can come up with is one that would end with my murder. Sadly, that's not enough of a deterrent, considering the month I've had. Are you the one hiring? I ask him. If you're the one applying. His voice is overtly friendly. I'm not used to overt friendliness, and I. Don't know what to do with it. I have a few questions before I agree to help you, I say, proud of myself. For not being so willingly killable. He grabs the help wanted sign and pulls it away from the window. He. 
tosses it inside the building and presses his back against the door, pushing it. Open as far as it will reach, motioning for me to come inside. We don't really have time for questions, but I promise I won't torture, rape, or kill you. If that helps. His voice is still pleasant, despite his phrase of choice. So is that smile. That shows off two rows of almost perfect teeth and a slightly crooked front. Left incisor. But that little awe in his smile is actually my favorite part of him. At and his complete disregard for my questions. I hate questions. Is might not be such a bad gig. I sigh and slip past him, making my way inside the building. What am I getting myself into? I mutter. Something you won't want to get out of, he says. E door closes. Behind us, blocking off all the natural lighting in the room. It wouldn't be a bad thing if there were interior lights on, but there aren't. Only a faint glow coming from what looks like a hallway on the other side of the room. As soon as the beat of my heart begins to inform me of how stupid I am. For walking into a building with a complete stranger, the lights begin to buzz and occur to life. Sorry. His voice is close, so I spin around just as the RST of the Yorosent lights reach their full power. I don't usually work in this part of the studio, so I keep the lights off to save energy. Now that the entire area is illuminated, I slowly scan the room. E walls are a stark white, adorned with various paintings. I can't get a good look at them, because they're all spread out, several feet away from me. Is this an art gallery? He laughs, which I nd unusual, so I spin around to face him. He's watching me with narrowed, curious eyes. I wouldn't go so far as to call it an art gallery. He turns and locks the front door and then walks past me. What size are you? He makes his way across the expansive room, toward the hallway. I still don't know why I'm here, but the fact that he's asking me what size I am has me a little more concerned than I was just two minutes ago. Is he wondering what size coffin I'll tee in? How to size the handcuffs? Okay, I'm a lot concerned. What do you mean? Like as in my clothing size. He faces me and walks backward, still heading in the direction of the hallway. Yes, your clothing size. You can't wear that tonight, he says. Pointing at my jeans and t-shirt. He motions for me to follow him as he turns to ascend a height of stairs leading to a room above the one we're in. I may be a sucker for a cute, crooked incisor, but following strangers into unknown territory is where I should probably draw the line. Wait, I say, stopping at the foot of the stairs. He pauses and turns around. Can you at least give me a rundown of what's happening right? Now, because I'm starting to second-guess my idiotic decision to place my trust in a complete stranger. He glances over his shoulder toward wherever the stairs lead and then back at me. He lets out an exasperated sigh before descending several steps. He takes a seat, coming eye to eye with me. His elbows meet his knees and he leans forward, smiling calmly. My name is Owen Gentry. I'm an artist. And this is my studio. I have a showing in less than an hour, I need someone. To handle all the transactions, and my girlfriend broke up with me last. Week. Artist. Showing. Less than an hour? And girlfriend? Not touching that one. I shift on my feet, glance behind me at the studio once more and then. Back to him. Do I get any kind of training? Do you know how to use a basic calculator? I roll my eyes. Yes. Consider yourself trained. I only need you for two hours tops and then. I'll give you your 200 bucks and you can be on your way. Two hours. 
200 bucks. Something isn't adding up. What's the catch? Air's no catch. Why would you need help if you pay $100 an hour, Air? Has to be a catch. You should be swarmed with potential applicants. Owen runs a palm across the scruff on his jaw, moving it back and forth. Like he's attempting to squeeze out the tension. My girlfriend failed to. Mentioned she was also quitting her job the day she broke up with me. I called. Her when she didn't show to help me set up two hours ago. It's kind of a. Last minute employment opportunity. Maybe you were just in the right. Place at the right time. He stands and turns around. I remain in my spot at. The bottom of the stairs. You made your girlfriend an employee, that's never a good idea. I made my employee a girlfriend. An even worse idea. He pauses at the top of the stairs and turns around, looking down at me. What's your name? Auburn. His gaze falls to my hair, which is understandable. Everyone assumes I was named Auburn due to my hair color, but it's strawberry blonde at best. Calling it red is a stretch. What's the rest of your name, Auburn? Mason Reed. Owen slowly tilts his head in the direction of the ceiling as he blows out. A breath of air. I follow his gaze and look at the ceiling with him, but... Nothing is up there other than white ceiling tiles. He takes his right hand. And touches his forehead, then his chest, and then continues the... Movements from shoulder to shoulder, until he's just made the sign of the... Cross over himself. What the hell is he doing? Praying. He looks back down at me, smiling now. Is Mason really your middle? Name. I nod. As far as I know, Mason isn't a strange middle name so I have no. Idea why he's performing religious rituals. We have the same middle name, he says. I regard him silently, allowing myself to take in the probability of his. Response. Are you serious? He nods casually and reaches into his back pocket, pulling out his wallet. He descends the stairs once more and hands me his license. I look it over. And sure enough, his middle name is Mason. I press my lips together and hand him back his driver's license. OMG. I try to contain the laughter, but it's hard, so I cover my mouth, hoping. I'm being inconspicuous about it. He slides his wallet back into his pocket. His eyebrow raises and he shoots me a look of suspicion. Are you that quick? My shoulders are shaking from the suppressed laughter now. I feel so bad. So, so bad for him. He rolls his eyes and looks slightly embarrassed in the way he attempts to hide his own smile. He heads back up the stairs much less condently than before. Is is why I never tell anyone my middle name, he mutters. I feel guilty for ending this so funny, but his humility nally gives me the courage to climb the rest of the stairs. Your initials are really OMG. I bite the inside of my cheek, forcing back the smile I don't want him to see. I reach the top of the stairs and he ignores me, heading straight for a dresser. He opens a drawer and begins rummaging through it, so I take the opportunity to look around the massive room. Here's a large bed, probably a king, in the far corner. In the opposite corner is a full kitchen anked by two doors, leading to other rooms. I'm in his apartment. He turns around and tosses me something black. I catch it and unfold it, revealing a skirt. At should tea. You and the trader look about the same size. He walks to the closet and removes a white shirt from a hanger. See. If this works. Issues you have on are any. I take the shirt from him and glance toward the two doors. Bathroom. He points to the door on the left. What if they don't tea? I ask, worried he won't be able to use my help if. I'm not dressed professionally. 
$200 isn't easy to come by. If they don't tea, we'll burn them along with everything else she left. Behind. I laugh and make my way to the bathroom. Once I'm inside, I pay no attention to the actual bathroom itself as I begin to change into the clothes. He gave me. Luckily, they tee perfectly. I look at myself in the full length. Mirror and cringe at the disaster that is my hair. I should be embarrassed to call myself a cosmetologist. I haven't touched it since I left the apartment. This morning, so I do a quick X and use one of Owen's combs to pull it up. Into a bun. I fold the clothes I just removed and set them on the countertop. When I exit the bathroom, Owen is in the kitchen, pouring two glasses of wine. I contemplate whether or not I should tell him I'm a few weeks shy of being old enough to drink, but my nerves are screaming for a glass of wine right now. Fitz, I say, walking toward him. He lifts his eyes and stares at my shirt for much longer than it takes to acknowledge whether or not a shirt t's. He clears his throat and looks back. Down at the wine he's pouring. Looks better on you, he says. I slide onto the stool, ding to hide my smile. It's been a while since. I've been complimented and I've forgotten how good it feels. You don't. Mean that. You're just bitter over your breakup. He pushes a glass of wine across the bar. I'm not bitter, I'm relieved. And I absolutely mean it. He raises his glass of wine, so I raise mine. 2. Ex-girlfriends and new employees. I laugh as our glasses clink together. Better than ex-employees and new. Girlfriends. He pauses with his glass at his lips and watches me sip from mine. When I'm nished, he grins, and Nally takes a sip. As soon as I set my wine glass back down on the countertop, something. Soft grazes my leg. My initial reaction is to scream, which is exactly what happens. Or maybe the noise that comes out of my mouth is more of a yelp. Either way, I pull both of my legs up and look down to see a black, long-haired cat rubbing the stool I'm seated on. I immediately lower my legs back to the oar and bend over to scoop up the cat. I don't know why, but knowing this guy has a cat eases my discomfort even more. It doesn't seem like someone could be dangerous if they own a pet. I know that isn't the best way to justify being in a stranger's apartment, but it does make me feel better. What's your cat's name? Owen reaches over and runs his engers through the cat's mane. Owen. I immediately laugh at his joke, but his expression remains calm. I pause. For a few seconds, waiting for him to laugh, but he doesn't. You named your cat after yourself? Seriously. He looks at me and I can see the slightest smile playing at the corner of his mouth. He shrugs, almost bashfully. She reminded me of myself. I laugh again. She? You named a girl Cat Owen. He looks down at Owen Cat and continues to pet her as I hold her. SHH, he says quietly. She can understand you. Don't give her a complex. As if he's right, and she can actually hear me making fun of her name. Owen Cat jumps out of my arms and lands on the oar. She disappears around the bar, and I force myself to wipe the grin off my face. I love that. He named a female cat after himself. Who does that? I lean my arm on the counter and rest my chin in my hand. So what do you need me to do tonight, OMG? Owen shakes his head and grabs the bottle of wine, storing it in the refrigerator. You can start by never again referring to me by my initials. After you agree to that, I'll give you the rundown of what's about to happen. I should feel bad, but he seems amused. Deal. First of all, he says, leaning forward across the bar, how old are you? Not old enough for wine. I take another sip. Oops, 
he says dryly. What do you do? Are you in college? He rests. His chin in his hand and waits for my response to his questions. How are these questions preparing me for work tonight? He smiles. His smile is exceptionally nice when accompanied by a few sips of wine. He nods once and stands straight. He takes the wine glass from my hand and sets it back down on the bar. Follow me, Auburn Mason. Read. I do what he asks, because for $100 an hour, I'll do almost anything. Almost. When we reach the main oar again, he walks into the center of the room and lifts his arms, making a full circle. I follow his gaze around the room, taking in the vastness of it. E-track lighting is what catches my eye. RST. Each light is focused on a painting adorning the stark white walls of the studio, pulling the focus to the art and nothing else. Well, there really isn't anything else. Just over to ceiling white walls, a polished concrete. Over, and art. It's both simple and overwhelming. Is is my studio. He pauses and points to a painting. That's the art. He points to a counter on the other side of the room. That's where you'll be most of the time. I'll work the room and you ring up the purchases. That's pretty much it. He explains it all so casually, as if anyone is perfectly capable of creating something of this magnitude. He rests his hands on his hips and waits for me to absorb it all. How old are you? I ask him. His eyes narrow and he dips his head slightly before looking away. 21. He says it like his age embarrasses him. It's almost as if he doesn't like that he's so young and already has what appears to be a successful career. I would have guessed much older. His eyes don't seem like the eyes of a 21-year-old. E wiry dark and deep, and I have the sudden urge to plunge into their depth so I can see everything he's seen. I glance away and place my attention on the art. I walk toward the painting closest to me, growing more and more aware of the talent behind the brush with each step. When I reach it, I suck in a breath. It's somehow sad and breathtaking and beautiful all at once. E painting is of a woman who seems to encompass both love and shame and every single emotion in between. What do you use besides acrylics? I ask, taking a step closer. I run my anger across the canvas and hear his footsteps close in on me. He pauses next to me, but I can't take my eyes off the painting long enough to look at him. I use a lot of different mediums, from acrylic to spray paint. It just depends on the piece. My eyes are drawn to a slip of paper next to the painting, adhered to the wall. I read the words sprawled across it. Sometimes I wonder if being dead would be easier than being his mother. I touch the paper and then look back at the painting. A confession. When I turn and face him, his playful smile is gone. His arms are folded tightly across his chest and his chin is tucked in. He looks at me as if he's nervous about my reaction. Yep, he says simply. I glance toward the window at all the pieces of paper lining the glass. My eyes move around the room to all the paintings and I notice strips of paper adhered to the walls next to every one. Ewiri all confessions, I say in awe. Are these from actual people? People you know. He shakes his head and motions toward the front door. Ewiri all. Anonymous. People leave their confessions in the slot over there, and I use some of them as inspiration for my art. I walk to the next painting and look at the confession before I even look at the interpreted piece. I've never let anyone see me without makeup. My greatest fear is what I'll look like at my funeral. I'm almost certain I'll be cremated, because my insecurities run so deep, they'll follow me into the afterlife. Thank you for that, 
mother. I immediately move my attention to the painting. It's incredible, I whisper, spinning around to take in more of what he's created. I walk to the window of confessions and ND1 written in red ink. And highlighted. I'm scared I'll never stop comparing my life without him to how my life was. When I was with him. I'm not sure if I'm more fascinated by the confessions, the art, or the fact. That I feel like I can relate to everything in here. I'm a very closed off. Person. I rarely share my true thoughts with anyone, regardless of how. Helpful it might be for me. Seeing all of these secrets and knowing that. These people have more than likely never shared these with anyone, and. Never will, makes me feel a sense of connection to them. A sense of. Belonging. In a way, the studio and the confessions remind me of Adam. Tell me something about yourself that no one else knows. Something I can. Keep for myself. I hate how I always tie Adam into everything I see and do, and I wonder if and when that will ever go away. It's been ve years since I last saw him. Five years since he passed away. Five years, and I'm wondering if, like the confession in front of me, I'll forever be comparing my life with him to my life without him. And I wonder if I'll ever not be disappointed. Chapter 2 Owen. She's here. Right here, standing in my studio, staring at my art. I never thought I'd see her again. I was so convinced that the likelihood of our paths ever crossing was minimal, I can't even remember the last time I thought about her. But here she is, standing right in front of me. I want to ask her if she remembers me, but I know she doesn't. How could she when we never even exchanged words? I remember her, though. I remember the sound of her laughter, her voice, her hair, even though her hair used to be a lot shorter. And even though I felt like I knew her back then, I never really got a good look at her face. Now that I'm seeing her up close, I have to force myself not to stare too hard. Not because of her unassuming beauty, but because it's exactly how I imagined she would look up close. I tried to paint her once, but I couldn't remember enough about her to niche it. I have a feeling I may attempt it again after tonight. And I already know I'll call the painting more in one. She moves her attention to another painting and I look away before she catches me staring at her. I don't want it to appear too obvious that I'm trying to gore out which colors to blend together to create her unique shade of skin tone, or whether I would paint her with her hair up or down. Here are so many things I should be doing right now other than staring at her. What should I be doing? Showering. Changing. Preparing for all the people who are about to show up for the next two hours. I need to take a quick shower, I say. She turns around, fast, as if I startled her. Feel free to look around. I'll go over everything else when I'm niched. I won't take long. She nods and smiles and for the RST time I think, Hannah who? Hannah, the last girl I hired to help me. Hannah, the girl who couldn't handle being second in my life. Hannah, the girl who broke up with me last week. I hope Auburn isn't like Hannah. There were so many things I didn't like about her, and that isn't how it should be. Hannah disappointed me when she spoke, which is why we spent a lot of our time together not speaking. And she always, always made it a point to tell me that her name, when spelled backward, was still Hannah. A palindrome, I said the RST time she told me. She looked at me. Perplexed, and that's when I knew I could never love her. What a waste of a palindrome she was, that Hannah. But I can already tell that Auburn isn't like Hannah. I can see the layers. 
of depth in her eyes. I can see the way my art moves her by the way she focuses on it, ignoring everything else around her. I hope she isn't like Hannah at all. She already looks better in Hannah's clothes than Hannah did. Did. Another palindrome. I walk into the bathroom and look at her clothes, and I want to walk them back downstairs to her. I want to tell her never mind, that I want her to wear her own clothes tonight, not Hannah's clothes. I want her to be herself, to be comfortable, but my customers are wealthy and elite and they expect black skirts and white shirts. Not blue jeans and this pink, is it pink? Or red, top that makes me think of Mrs. Dennis, my high school art teacher. Mrs. Dennis loved art. Mrs. Dennis also loved artists. And one day, after seeing how incredibly talented with a brush she thought I was, Mrs. Dennis loved me. Her shirt was pink or red, or maybe both, that day, and that's what I remember as I look down at Auburn's shirt, because Mrs. Dennis, who, she was not a palindrome, but her name spelled backwards was still very, thing, because Dennis equals sinned, and that's precisely what we did. We sinned for an entire hour. She more so than me. And don't think that hasn't been a confession turned into a painting. It, was one of the RST I ever sold. I named it She Sinned With Me. Hallelujah. But alas, I don't want to think about high school or Mrs. Dennis or palindrome Hannah because they are the past and this is the present, and Auburn is somehow both. She would be shocked if she knew how much of her past has affected my present, which is why I won't be sharing the truth with her. Some secrets should never turn into confessions. I know that. Better than anyone. I'm not sure what to do with the fact that she just showed up at my doorstep, wide-eyed and quiet, because I don't know what to believe. Anymore. Half an hour ago I believed in coincidences and happenstance. Now. The idea that her being here is simply a coincidence is laughable. When I make it back downstairs, she's standing statue still, staring up at. The painting I call you don't exist, God. And if you do, you should be. Ashamed. I wasn't the one who named it, of course. I'm never the one who names. The paintings. EY are all titled by the anonymous confessions that inspire. Them. I don't know why, but this confession inspired me to paint my. Mother. Not as I remember her, but how I imagined she looked when she was my age. And the confession didn't remind me of her because of her religious views. He words just reminded me of how I felt in the months following her death. I'm not sure if Auburn believes in God, but something about this painting got to her. A tear rolls down her cheek and slides slowly toward her jaw. She hears me, or maybe she sees me stand beside her, because she brushes her cheek with the back of her hand and takes a breath. She seems embarrassed to have connected with this piece. Or maybe she's just embarrassed that I saw her connect with it. Instead of asking her what she thinks of the painting, or why she's crying, I just stare at the painting with her. I've had this one for over a year. And just yesterday decided to put it in today's showing. I don't usually keep them for this long, but for reasons I don't understand, this one was harder to give up than the rest. Ewiri all hard to give up, but some more so than others. Maybe I'm afraid that once they leave my hands, the paintings will be misunderstood, unappreciated. That was a fast shower, she says. She's trying to change the subject, even though we weren't speaking out loud. We both know that even though we've been quiet, the subject for the last few minutes has been her tears and what prompted them and why do you love this piece so much, Auburn? 
I take fast showers, I say, and realize my response is unimpressive and. Why am I even trying to be impressive? I turn and face her and she does the. Same, but not before looking down at her feet rst, because she's still. Embarrassed that I saw her connect with my art. I love that she looked at. Her feet rst, because I love that she's embarrassed. In order to be. Embarrassed, a person has to care about the opinions of others rst. That means she cares about my opinion, even if only a fraction. And I. Like that, because I obviously care about her opinion of me, or I wouldn't be. Secretly hoping she doesn't do or say anything that reminds me of. Palindrome Hannah. She spins around, slowly, and I try to think of something more. Impressive to say to her. It's not enough time, though, because her eyes are. Back on mine and it looks like she's hoping I'm the condent one and will. Be the RST to speak. I'll speak RST, although I don't think condense has anything to do with. It. I look down at my wrist to check the time I'm not even wearing a watch. And I quickly scratch at a non-existent itch so that I don't look like I'm not. Condent. We open in 15 minutes, so I should explain how things. Work. She exhales, seeming more relieved and relaxed than she did before that. Sentence left my mouth. Sounds good, she says. I walk to you don't exist, God and I point to the confession tape to the wall. E confessions are also the titles of the pieces E prices are written. On the back. All you do is ring up the purchase, have them LL out an information card for delivery of the painting, and attach the confession to the delivery card so I'll know where to send it. She nods and stares at the confession. She wants to see it, so I take it off the wall and hand it to her. I watch as she reads the confession again before ipping the card over. Do you think people ever buy their own confessions? I know they do. I've had people admit to me that they're the ones who wrote the confession. Yes, but I prefer not to know. She looks at me like I'm insane, but also with fascination, so I accept it. Why wouldn't you want to know, she asks. I shrug and her eyes drop to my shoulder and maybe linger on my neck. It makes me wonder what she's thinking when she looks at me like this. You know when you hear a band on the radio and you have this vision. Of them in your head. I ask her. But then you see a picture or a video of them and it's nothing like you assumed. Not necessarily better or worse. Than you imagined, just different. She nods in understanding. That's what it's like when I've niched a painting and someone tells me. Their confession inspired it. When I'm painting, I create a story in my head. Of what inspired the confession and who it came from. But when I end out. That the image I had while painting doesn't tee the actual image standing in front of me, it somehow invalidates the art for me. She smiles and looks at her feet again. Here's a song called Hold On. By the band Alabama Shakes, she says, explaining the reason behind her. Ush cheeks. I listened to that song for more than a month before I saw the video and realized the singer was a woman. Talk about a mind fuck. I laugh. She understands exactly what I'm saying, and I can't stop smiling. Because I know that band, and I nd it hard to believe anyone would think. The singer was a man. She says her own name in the song, doesn't she? She shrugs and now I'm staring at her shoulder. I thought he was. Referring to someone else, she says, still calling the singer a he even though. She knows it's a she now. Her eyes utter away, and she walks around me toward the counter. She's still holding the confession in her hand, and I let her hold it. Have you ever thought of allowing people to purchase anonymously? I walk to the opposite side of the counter and I lean forward, closer to her. Can't say that I have. She runs her engers over the counter, the calculator, 
the information. Cards, my business cards. She picks one up. She IPS it over. You should. Put confessions on the backs of these. As soon as those words leave her mouth, her lips press into a tight line. She thinks I'm insulted by her suggestions, but I'm not. How would it benefit me if the purchases were anonymous? Well, she says, treading carefully, if I were one of the people who wrote one of these she holds up the confession in her hand I would be too embarrassed to buy it. I'd be afraid you would know it was me who wrote it. I think it's rare that people who write the confession actually come to a showing. She hands me the confession, Nally, and then crosses her arms over the counter. Even if I didn't write the confession, I'd be too embarrassed to buy the painting for fear that you would assume I wrote it. She makes a good point. I think the confessions add an element of realness to your paintings that can't be found in other art. If a person walks into a gallery and sees a painting they connect with, they might buy it. But if a person walks into your gallery and sees a painting or a confession they connect with, they might not want to connect with it. But they do. And they're embarrassed. That they connect with a painting about a mother admitting she might not love her own child. And if they hand the confession card to whoever is going to ring up their purchase, they're essentially saying to that person, I connected with this horrible admission of guilt. I might be in awe of her, and I try not to look at her with so much obvious fascination. I straighten up but can't shake the sudden urge to hibernate inside her head. Ferment in her thoughts. You make a good argument. She smiles at me. Who's arguing? Not us. Denny Telly not us. So let's do it, then, I say to her. We'll place a number below every painting and people can bring you the number rather than the confession. Card. It'll give them a sense of anonymity. I notice every tiny detail of her reaction as I walk around the counter. Toward her. She grows an inch taller and sucks in a small breath. I reach. Around her and pick up a piece of paper, and then reach across her for the. Scissors. I don't make eye contact with her when I do these things so close. To her, but she's staring at me, almost as if she's willing me to. I look around the room and begin counting the paintings when she interrupts and says, here are 22. She almost seems embarrassed that she knew how many paintings there were, because she glances away and clears her throat. I counted them earlier. While you were in the shower, she takes the scissors from my hands and begins cutting the paper. Do you have a black marker? I retrieve one and set it down on the counter. Why do you think I need confessions on my business cards? She continues to meticulously cut the squares while she answers me. E-confessions are fascinating. It sets your studio apart from all the rest. If you have confessions on your business cards, it'll pique interest. She's right again. I can't believe I haven't thought of that yet. She must. Be a business major. What do you do for a living, Auburn? I cut hair at a salon a few blocks away. Her answer lacks pride and it. Makes me sad for her. You should be a business major. She doesn't respond, and I'm afraid I may have just insulted her. Profession. Not that cutting hair is something you shouldn't be proud of, I. Say. I just think you have a brain for business. I pick up the black marker and begin writing numbers on the squares, 1 to 22, because that's how many paintings she said are hanging and I believe her enough not to recount them. How often are you open? She completely ignores my insult slash compliment regarding her profession. First Thursday of every month. She looks at me, perplexed. Only once a month. I nod. I told you it's not really an art gallery. I don't show other artists. 
and I'm rarely open. It's just something I started doing a few years back and it took off, especially after I got a front page feature last year in the Dallas Morning News. I do well enough the one night I'm open to make a living. Good for you, she says, genuinely impressed. I've never really tried to be impressive before, but she makes me a little bit proud of myself. Do you always have a set number of paintings available? I love that she's so interested. No. One time, about three months ago, I opened with only one painting. She turns and faces me. Why only one? I shrug, playing it off. I wasn't very inspired to paint that month. Is isn't entirely the truth. It was when I RST began seeing palindrome. Hannah, and most of my time was spent inside of her that month. Attempting to focus on her body and ignore the fact that I didn't connect as much with her mind. Auburn doesn't need to know any of that though. What was the confession? I look at her questioningly, because I'm not sure what she's talking about. E1 painting you did that month, she clarries. What was the confession that inspired it? I think back to that month and back to the only confession I seem to want to paint. Even though it wasn't my confession, it somehow feels like it was now that she's asking me to tell her what my only inspiration was for that entire month. He painting was called When I'm With You, I ink of all the great things I could be if I were without you. She keeps her focus on me and her eyebrows are furrowed as if she's Trying to get to know my story through this confession. Her expression relaxes and keeps falling until she looks disturbed. That's really sad, she says. She glances away, either to hide that this confession bothered her or to hide that she's still trying to decipher me through the confession. She glances at some of the paintings closest to us so that she's not looking directly at me anymore. We're playing a game of hide and seek and the paintings are home base, apparently. You must have been extremely inspired this month, because 22 is a big number. That's almost a painting a day. I want to say, just wait until next month, but I don't. Some of these are old paintings EY weren't all made this month. I reach around her again, for the tape this time, but it's different. It's different. Because I accidentally touch her arm with my hand, and I haven't actually touched her until now. But we Denny Telly just made contact, and she's absolutely real, and I hold on extra tight to the tape because I want more of whatever that was she just unintentionally delivered. I want to say, did you feel that, too, but I don't have to because I can see the chills run up her arm. I want to put down the tape and touch one of those tiny bumps I just created on her skin. She clears her throat and takes a quick step back into the expansiveness of the room and away from the closeness of us. I breathe, relieved by the space she just put between us. She seems uncomfortable, and honestly, I was becoming uncomfortable, because I'm Still trying to wrap my mind around the fact that she's actually here. If I had to guess, I would say that she's an introvert. Someone who isn't. Used to being around other people, much less people who are complete. Strangers to her. She seems a lot like me. A loner, a thinker, an artist with. Her life. And it appears as though she's afraid I'll alter her canvas if she allows me. Too close. She doesn't need to worry. E feeling is mutual. We spend the next 15 minutes hanging the numbers below each. Painting. I watch as she writes down the name of each confession on a piece. Of paper and correlates it with its number. She acts like she's done this a. Million times. I think she might be one of those people who are good at. Everything they do. She has a talent for life. Do people always show up to these things, she asks as we walk back to the counter. 
I love the fact that she has no idea about my studio or my art. Come here. I walk toward the front door, smiling at her innocence and curiosity. It gives me a nostalgic feeling reminiscent of the RST night I opened over three years ago. She brings back a little of that excitement, and I wish it could always be like this. When we reach the front door, I pull away one of the confessions so she can take a peek outside. I watch her eyes grow wide as she takes in the line of people that I know are standing at the door. It didn't always used to be like this. Since the front page feature last year, word of mouth has increased. The amount of traffic I get, and I've been very lucky. Exclusivity, she whispers, taking a step back. I attach the confession back to the window. What do you mean? That's why you do so well. Because you restrict the amount of days. You're open and you can only make so many paintings in a month. It makes your art worth more to people. Are you saying I don't do well because of my talent? I smile when I say this so she knows I'm only teasing. She shoves my shoulder playfully. You know what I mean. I want her to shove my shoulder again, because I love the way she smiled when she did it, but instead she turns and faces the open oar of the studio. She draws in a slow breath. It makes me wonder if seeing all the people outside has made her nervous. You ready? She nods and forces a smile. Ready. I open the doors and the people begin pouring in. Airs a big crowd. Tonight and for the RST several minutes, I worry that this will intimidate her. But regardless of how quiet and a little bit shy she seemed when she RST showed up here, she's the exact opposite now. She's hourishing, as if she's somehow in her element, when this probably isn't a situation she's ever been in before. I wouldn't know that from watching her, though. For the RST half hour, she mingles with the guests and discusses the art. And some of the confessions. I recognize a few faces, but most of them are. People I don't know. She acts like she knows all of them. She eventually. Walks back to the counter when she sees someone pull the number VE. Down. Number VE correlates to the painting titled I went to China for two. Weeks without telling anyone. When I returned, no one noticed I'd been gone. She smiles at me from across the room as she's ringing up her RST. Transaction. I continue to work the crowd, mingling, all the while watching. Her out of the corner of my eye. Tonight, everyone's focus is on my art, but. My focus is on her. She's the most interesting piece in this entire room. Will your father be here tonight? Owen. I look away from her long enough to answer Judge Corley's question. With a shake of my head. He couldn't make it tonight, I lie. If I were a priority in his life, he would have made it. That's a shame, Judge Corley says. I'm having my office redecorated. And he suggested I stop by to check out your work. Judge Corley is a man with a height of VE feet six but an ego twice as tall. My father is a lawyer and spends a lot of time in the courthouse. Downtown, where Judge Corley's office is. I know this because my father isn't a fan of Judge Corley's, and despite Judge Corley's show of interest, I'm pretty sure he's not a fan of my father's. Surface friends is what I call it. When your friendship is merely a facade and your enemies on the inside. My father has a lot of surface. Friends. I think it's a side effect of being a lawyer. I don't have any. I don't want any. You have exceptional talent, although I'm not sure it's quite my taste. Judge Corley says, moving around me to view another painting. An hour quickly passes. She's been busy most of the time, and even. When she isn't, she NDS something to do. She doesn't just sit behind the. Counter and look bored like palindrome Hannah did. 
Hannah perfected the art of boredom, laying her nails so much during the two showings she worked for me, I'm surprised she even had nails left by the end of it. Auburn doesn't look bored. She looks like she's having fun. Whenever there isn't someone at the counter, she's up and mingling and smiling and laughing at the jokes that I know she thinks are lame. She sees Judge Corley approach the table with a number. She smiles at him and says something, but he just grunts. When she looks down at the number, I see a frown form on her lips, but she quickly shoves it away with a fake smile. Her eyes briefly meet the painting titled You Don't Exist. God. And I immediately understand the look on her face. Judge Corley is buying the painting and she knows as well as I do that he doesn't deserve it. I quickly make my way to the counter. Air spin a misunderstanding. Judge Corley looks at me, annoyed, and Auburn glances up at me in surprise. I take the number out of her hand. His painting isn't for sale. Judge Corley huffs and points to the number in my hand. Well, the number was still on the wall. I thought that meant it was for sale. I put the number in my pocket. It sold before we opened, I say. I guess I forgot to take down the number. I wave toward the painting behind him. One of the few left. Would something like this work for you? Judge Corley rolls his eyes and puts his wallet back in his pocket. No, it won't, he says. I like the orange in the other painting. It matches the leather in my office sofa. He likes it for the orange. Thank God I saved it from him. He motions for a woman standing several feet away and he begins walking toward her. Ruth, he says, let's just stop by the pottery barn. Tomorrow. There's nothing here I like. I watch as they leave, then turn and face Auburn again. She's grinning. Couldn't let him take your baby, could you? I let out a breath of relief. I would have never forgiven myself. She glances behind me at someone approaching so I step aside and let her work her magic. Another half hour passes and most of the paintings have been purchased when the last person leaves for the night. I lock the door behind them. I turn around and she's still standing behind the counter, organizing the sales. Her smile is huge and she isn't trying to hide it at all. Whatever stress she walked into the studio with, it's not plaguing her right now. Right now. She's happy and it's intoxicating. You sold 19, she says, almost in a squeal. OMG, Owen. Do you realize how much money you just made? And do you realize I just used your initials in my sentence? I laugh because yes, I realize how much money I just made, and yes, I realize she just used my initials in a sentence. But it's okay, because she was adorable doing it. She also must have a natural ability to conduct business. Because I can honestly say I've never sold 19 paintings in one night. So. I ask, hopeful that this won't be the last time she helps me. You. Busy next month. She's already smiling, but my job offer makes her smile even bigger. She. Shakes her head and looks up at me. I'm never busy when it comes to a hundred dollars an hour. She's counting the money, separating the bills into piles. She takes two of the one hundred dollar bills and holds them up, smiling. S.A.R. Mine. She folds them and tucks them into the front pocket of her, or palindrome Hannah's, shirt. My high from the night begins to fade the moment I realize she's nished, and I don't know how to prolong the time between us. I'm not ready for her to leave yet, but she's tucking the cash away in a drawer and stacking the orders into a pile on the counter. It's after nine, I say. You're probably starving. 
I use this as an opening to see if she wants something to eat, but her eyes immediately grow wide and her smile disappears. It's already after nine. Her voice is full of panic and she quickly turns and sprints for the stairs. She takes them two at a time, I had no idea she was capable of displaying so much urgency. I expect her to come rushing back down the stairs with the same haste. But she doesn't, so I make my way toward the stairs. When I reach the top step, I can hear her voice. I'm so sorry, she says. I know, I know. She's quiet for several seconds, and then she sighs. Okay that's okay. I'll talk to you tomorrow. When the call comes to an end, I walk up the stairs, curious what kind. A phone call could cause someone to feel so much panic. I see her, sitting. Quietly at the bar, staring at the phone in her hands. I watch her wipe away. The second tier tonight, and I immediately dislike whoever was on the other. End of that call. I don't like the person who made her feel this way, when. Just a few minutes ago she couldn't stop smiling. She lays her phone face down on the bar when she notices me standing at. The top of the stairs. She isn't sure if I saw that tear just now I did so she. Forces a smile. Sorry about that, she says. She's really good at hiding her true emotions. So good, it's scary. It's okay, I say. She stands up and glances toward the bathroom. She's about to suggest. That it's time to change her clothes and go home. I'm scared if she does that. I'll never see her again. We have the same middle name. That could be fate, you know. I have a tradition, I tell her. I'm lying, but she seems like the type of. Girl who wouldn't want to break a guy's tradition. My best friend is the. Bartender across the street. I always go have a drink with him after my. Showings are over. I want you to come with me. She glances at the bathroom once more. Based on her hesitation, I can. Only conclude that either she doesn't frequent bars or she's just not sure if. She wants to go to one with me. EY also serve food, I say, attempting to downplay the fact that I just. Asked her to a bar for a drink. Appetizers mostly, but they're pretty good. And I'm starving. She must be hungry because her eyes light up when I mention. Appetizers. Do they have cheese sticks, she asks. I'm not sure if they have cheese sticks, but I'll say anything at this point. Just to spend a few more minutes with her. He best in town. Again, her expression is hesitant. She glances down at the phone in her. Hands and then looks back up at me. I. She bites her bottom lip. Embarrassed. I should probably call my roommate RST. Just to let her know. Where I am. I'm usually home by now. Of course. She looks down at her phone and dials a number. She waits for the other. Person to pick up. Hey. She says into the phone. It's me. She smiles at me reassuringly. I'll be late tonight, I'm having drinks with someone. She pauses for a second and then looks up at me with a twisted expression. Um. Yeah, I. Guess. He's right here. She holds the phone out toward me. She wants to talk to you. I step toward her and take the phone. Hello. What's your name, a girl on the other end of the line says. Owen Gentry. Where are you taking my roommate? She's grilling me in a monotone, authoritative voice. To Harrison's bar. What time will she be home? I don't know. A couple of hours from now, maybe. I look to Auburn. For confirmation, but she just shrugs her shoulders. Take care of her, she says. I'm giving her a secret phrase to use if she needs to call me for help. And if she doesn't call me at midnight to let me know she's home safe, I'm calling the police and reporting her murder. Um. 
Okay, I say with a laugh. Let me talk to Auburn again, she says. I hand the phone back to Auburn, a little more nervous than before. I can tell by the confused expression on her face that she's hearing about the secret phrase rule for the RST time. I'm guessing either she and this roommate haven't been living together for very long, or Auburn never goes out. What? Auburn says into the phone. What kind of secret phrase is? Pencil dick. She slaps her hand over her mouth and says, sorry, after accidentally blurting it out. She's quiet for a bit and then her face contorts into confusion. Seriously? Why can't you choose normal words, like raisin or rainbow? She shakes her head with a quiet laugh. Okay. I'll call you at midnight. She ends the call and smiles. Emery. She's a little strange. I nod, agreeing with the strange part. She points to the bathroom. Ken. I change RST. I tell her to go ahead, relieved that she'll be back in the clothes I found. Her in. When she disappears into the bathroom, I pull out my phone to text. Harrison. Me, I'm coming for a drink. Do you serve cheese sticks? Harrison, nope. Me, do me a favor. When I order cheese sticks, don't say you don't serve them. Just say. You ran out. Harrison, okay. Random request, but whatever. Chapter 3 Auburn Life is strange. I have no idea how I went from working at the salon this morning, to an appointment at a law office this afternoon, to working at an art studio. Tonight, to walking into a bar for the RST time in my life. I was too embarrassed to tell Owen I've never been to a bar before, but I'm pretty sure he could tell by my hesitation at the door. I didn't know what to expect when we walked in because I'm not yet 21. I reminded Owen of this and he shook his head and told me not to mention it if Harrison asks for ID. Just tell him you left it at the studio and I'll vouch for you. It's Denny Telly not what I expected a bar would look like. I imagined disco. Balls and a huge, central dance over, and John Travolta. In reality, this bar is much less dramatic than I imagined. It's quiet, and I could probably count the number of occupants on both hands. Here are more tables covering the over than there is room to dance. And there's no disco ball anywhere in sight. I'm a little disappointed by that. Owen weaves through a few tables until he gets to the back of the dimly lit room. He pulls out a stool and motions for me to sit while he takes the one next to it. There's a guy at the other end of the bar who looks up at us just as I'm taking my seat, and I assume this is Harrison. He looks to be in his late twenties, with a head full of curly, red hair. A combination of his fair skin and the fact that there are four leaf clovers on almost every sign in this place makes me wonder if he's Irish or if he just wishes he were. I know it shouldn't surprise me that this guy owns a bar and appears this young, because if everyone around here is anything like Owen, this city must be full of young entrepreneurs. Great. Makes me feel even more out of place. Harrison nods his head in Owen's direction and then Bree glances at me. He doesn't stare long, and then his eyes are back on Owen's with a perplexed look. I don't know what has this guy confused, but Owen ignores the look he shoots him and turns to face me. You were great tonight, he says. His chin is resting in his hand and he's smiling. His compliment makes me smile back, or maybe it's just him. He's got such an innocent, charming vibe. He way his eyes crinkle in the corners. Makes his smile seem more genuine than other people's. So were you. We both just continue to smile at each other and I realize. 
that although bars aren't typically my scene, I'm actually enjoying myself. I haven't in so long, and I don't know why Owen seems to extract a whole different side of me, but I like it. I also know that I have so many other things I should be focusing on right now, but it's one night. One drink. What harm can it do? He lays his arm on the bar and swivels his chair until he's facing me foolin'. I do the same, but the chairs are really close together and our knees end up overlapping. He adjusts himself until one of my knees is between both of his, and one of his is between both of mine. We aren't too close and it's not as though we're rubbing our legs together, but they're Denny Telly touching. And it's kind of an intimate way to be seated with someone I barely know. He looks down at our legs. Are we erding? Now we're looking at each other again and we're both still grinning and it hits me that I don't think either of us has stopped grinning since we left his studio. I shake my head. I don't know how to IRT. He looks back down at our legs and is about to comment when Harrison approaches us. He leans forward and casually rests his arms on the bar, placing his attention on Owen. How'd it go? Harrison is Denny Telly Irish. I almost can't even understand him, his accent is so thick. Owen smiles in my direction. Pretty damn good. Harrison nods and then focuses on me. You must be Hannah. He reaches his hand out to me. I'm Harrison. I don't look at Owen, but I can hear him clearing his throat. I take Harrison's hand and shake it. Nice to meet you, Harrison, but I'm actually Auburn. Harrison's eyes grow wide and he slowly turns back to Owen. Shit. Man, he says, laughing apologetically. I can't keep up with you. Owen waves it off. It's any, he says. Auburn knows about Hannah. I don't really. I'm assuming Hannah is the girl who just dumped him. The only thing I do know is that Owen told me coming to this bar after a showing was tradition. So I'm curious how Harrison has never met Hannah. If she's worked shows for Owen before. Owen looks at me and can see the confusion on my face. I never brought her here. Owen has never brought anyone here, Harrison offers. He looks back at Owen. What happened to Hannah? Owen shakes his head like he doesn't really want to talk about it. E. Usual. Harrison doesn't ask what the usual is, so I'm assuming he understands. Exactly what happened to Hannah. I just wish I knew what the usual. Meant. What can I get you to drink, Auburn? Harrison asks. I look at Owen a little wide-eyed, because I have no idea what to order. I've never ordered a drink before, considering I'm not yet old enough to do. So. He understands my expression and immediately turns back to Harrison. Bring us two Jack and Cokes, he says. And an order of cheese sticks. Harrison taps the bar with his ST and says, coming right up. He. Begins to turn around but quickly faces Owen again. Oh, we're all out of. Cheese sticks. Travesty. Cheese fries okay. I try not to frown, but I was really looking forward to cheese sticks. Owen looks at me and I nod. Sounds good, I say. Harrison smiles and begins to turn around but then faces me yet again. You're over 21, right? I quickly nod, and for a second I see doubt appear in his expression, but... He turns and walks away without asking for my identification. You're a horrible liar, Owen laughs. I expel a breath. I don't normally lie. I can see why, he says. He adjusts his position on the stool, and our legs brush together again. He smiles. What's your story, Auburn? Here we go. A moment when I usually call it a night before the night. Even get started. Whoa, he says. What's the look for? 
I realize I must be frowning when he says this. My story is that I have a very private life and I don't like to talk about it. He smiles, which isn't the reaction I was expecting. Sounds a lot like my story. Harrison is back with the drinks, saving us from what was about to become a failed conversation. We both take a drink at the same time, but his goes down a whole lot smoother than mine does. Despite being underage, I've had a few drinks in the past with friends back in Portland. But this is a tad strong for my taste. I cover my mouth to cough and Owen, of course, smiles again. Well, since neither of us feels like talking at all, do you at least dance? He glances over my shoulder at the small, empty dance or on the opposite side of the room. I immediately shake my head. How did I know that would be your answer? He stands up. Come. On. I shake my head again and almost instantly, my mood changes. Ears. No way I'm dancing with him, especially to whatever slow song just started. Playing. He grabs my hand and tries to pull me up, but I'm gripping my chair with my other hand, ready to ght him off if I have to. You really don't want to dance, he asks. I really don't want to dance. He stares at me for a few quiet seconds and then takes a seat back in his chair. He leans forward and motions for me to come closer. He still has hold of my hand, and I feel his thumb brush slightly over mine. He Continues to lean toward me until his mouth is close to my ear. Ten. Seconds, he whispers. Just give me ten seconds on the dance over. If you. Still don't want to dance with me after my time is up, you can walk away. Air are chills on my arms and legs and neck, and his voice is so. Soothing and convincing, I can feel myself nodding before I even know. What I'm agreeing to. But 10 seconds is simple. 10 seconds I can do. 10 seconds isn't. Enough time to embarrass myself. And after his time is up, I'll come back. And sit down and he'll leave me alone about dancing, hopefully. He's standing again, pulling me toward the dance over. I'm relieved the place is relatively empty. Even though we'll be the only ones dancing, the place is deserted enough that I won't feel like I'm the center of attention. We reach the dance hour and he slips a hand to my lower back. One, I whisper. He smiles when he realizes I'm actually counting. He uses his other hand. To position my hands around his neck. I've seen couples dance enough to. Know how to stand, at least. Two. He shakes his head with a laugh and wraps his free hand around my. Lower back, pulling me against him. Re. He begins to sway, and this is where dancing becomes confusing to me. I. Have no idea what to do next. I look down at our feet, hoping to get an idea. Of what I'm supposed to do with mine. He rests his forehead against mine. And also looks down at our feet. Just follow my lead, he says. His hands. Slide to my waist and he gently guides my hips in the direction he wants me. To move. 4. I whisper as I move with him. I can feel him relaxing just a little bit when he sees I've got it down. His. Hands slip to my back once again and he pulls me even closer. Naturally, my. Arms loosen slightly and I lean into him. His smell is intoxicating and before I realize what I'm doing, my eyes are closed and I'm inhaling the scent of him. He still smells like he just stepped out of the shower, even though it's been hours. I think I like dancing. It feels very natural, as if dancing is part of a human's biological purpose. It's a lot like sex, actually. I have about as much experience with sex as I do with dancing, but I Denny Telly remember every moment I spent with Adam. It can be very intimate, the way two bodies come together and 
somehow know exactly what to do and exactly how to tea while doing it. I can feel my pulse getting faster and warmth spreading over me, and it's been so long since I've felt this way. I wonder if it's the dancing that's doing this to me or if it's Owen. I've never slow danced before, so I have no other dance to compare it to. The only thing I have to measure this feeling against is the way Adam used to make me feel, and this is pretty close to that. It's been a long time since I've wanted someone to kiss me. Or maybe it's just been a long time since I've allowed myself to feel this way. Owen lifts his hand to the back of my head and lowers his mouth to my ear. It's been ten seconds, he whispers. Do you want to stop? I shake my head softly. I can't see his face, but I know he's smiling. He pulls me against his chest and rests his chin on top of my head. I close my eyes and breathe him in. Again. We dance like this until the song ends, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to let go RST or if he's supposed to let go RST, but neither of us does. Another song begins and luckily, it's slow like the last one, so we just keep moving as though the RST song never ended. I don't know when Owen began moving his hand away from the back of my head, but it's slowly moving down my back, making my arms and legs feel so weak, I question their existence. I nd myself wishing he would pick me up and carry me, preferably straight to his bed. His initials are very appropriate for the way he's making me feel right. Now. I want to whisper, OMG, over and over. I pull away from his chest and look up at him. He's not smiling right. Now. He's piercing me with eyes that seem a thousand shades darker than. When we walked into this bar. I unlock my hands, and I slide one against his neck. I'm surprised I feel comfortable enough to do this, and even more surprised by his reaction. He exhales softly and I can feel the chills erupt over the skin on his neck as his eyes fall shut and his forehead meets mine. I'm pretty sure I just fell in love with this song, he says. And I hate this song. I laugh a little and he pulls me closer, resting my head against his chest. We don't speak, and we don't stop dancing until the song ends. E third. Song begins to play and it isn't something I'm willing to dance to. Considering it's not a slow song. When we both accept that the dance is. Over, we inhale simultaneous breaths and begin to separate. His expression is full of concentrated intent, and as much as I like his. Smile, I also really like it when he looks at me like this. My arms leave his neck and his hands leave my waist and we're both standing on the dance. Or, staring at each other awkwardly, and I'm not sure what to do now. He thing about dancing, he says, folding his arms across his chest, is. That no matter how good it feels when you're doing it, it's always extremely. Awkward when it's over. It makes me feel good to know that it's not just me who doesn't know. What to do now. His hand touches my shoulder, and he urges me back. Toward the bar. We have drinks to nish. And fries to eat, I add. He didn't ask me to dance again. In fact, as soon as we got back to the bar. He seemed like he was in a hurry to get out of there. I ate most of the fries. While he chatted with Harrison a little more. He could tell I wasn't really. Digging my drink so he nished it for me. Now we're walking back outside. And it feels a little bit awkward again, like when the dance came to an end. Only now, it's the entire night that's coming to an end, and I hate that I really don't want to say goodbye to him yet. But I'm certainly not about to suggest we go back to his studio. Which way is your place, he asks. My eyes swing to his and I'm shocked by his forwardness. You aren't. Coming over, I immediately say. Auburn, he says, laughing, it's late. I'm offering to walk you home, not. 
asking to spend the night. I inhale, embarrassed at my assumption. Oh. I point to the right. I'm. About 15 blocks that way. He smiles and waves a hand in that direction, and we both begin. Walking. But if I were asking to spend the night. I laugh and push him playfully. I would tell you to fuck off. Chapter 4 Owen If I were 11 years old again, I would shake my magic 8 ball and ask it. Silly questions, like does Auburn Mason read like me? Does she think I'm cute? And I might be making assumptions based on the way she's looking at me right now, but I expect the answer would be it is decidedly so. We continue walking away from the bar, toward her apartment, and considering it's quite a few blocks away, I can probably think of enough questions between here and there to get to know her a whole lot better. E. One thing I've been wanting to know most since I saw her standing in front of my studio tonight is why she's back in Texas. You never told me why you moved to Texas. She looks alarmed by my comment, but I don't know why. I never told you I wasn't from Texas. I smile to cover up my mistake. I shouldn't know she isn't from Texas. Because as far as she knows, I know nothing about her other than what she's told me tonight. I do my best to hide what's really going through my head. Because if I were to come clean with her now, it would make me look like I've been hiding something from her for the majority of the night. I have. But it's too late for me to admit that now. You didn't have to tell me. Your accent told me. She watches me closely, and I can tell she's not going to answer my question, so I think of a different question to replace that one, but the next question is even more rushed. Do you have a boyfriend? She quickly looks away and it makes my heart sting because for some reason, she looks guilty. I assume this means she does have a boyfriend, and... Dances like the one I just shared with her shouldn't happen with girls who have boyfriends. No. My heart instantly feels better. I smile again, for about the millionth time since IRST saw her at my door tonight. I don't know if she knows this about me yet, but I hardly ever smile. I wait for her to ask me a question, but she's quiet. Are you gonna ask? me if I have a girlfriend. She laughs. No. She broke up with you last week. Oh, yeah. I forgot we've already visited the subject. Lucky me. That's not very nice, she says with a frown. I'm sure it was a hard decision for her. I disagree with a shake of my head. It was an easy decision for her. It's an easy decision for all of them. She pauses for a second or two, eyeing me warily before she begins. Walking again. All of them. I realize this doesn't make me sound good, but I'm not about to lie to her. Plus, if I tell her the truth, she might continue to trust me and ask me even more questions. Yes. I get broken up with a lot. She squints her eyes and scrunches her nose up at my response. Why do you think that is, Owen? I try to pad the harshness of the sentence about to come out of my mouth by speaking softer, but it's not a fact I necessarily want to admit to her. I'm not a very good boyfriend. She looks away, probably not wanting me to see the disappointment in her eyes. I saw it anyway, though. What makes you a bad boyfriend? I'm sure there are lots of reasons, but I focus on the most obvious. Answers. I put a lot of other things before my relationships. For most girls. Not being a priority is a pretty good reason to end things. I glance at her to see if she's still frowning or if she's judging me. Instead. She has a thoughtful look on her face and she's nodding. So Hannah broke up with you because you wouldn't make time for her. That's what it boiled down to, yes. 
How long were the two of you together? Not long. A few months. Re, maybe. Did you love her? I want to look at her, to see the look on her face after she asks me this. Question, but I don't want her to see the look on my face. I don't want her to. Think my frown means I'm heartbroken, because I'm not. If anything, I'm. Sad that I couldn't love her. I think love is a hard word to Dean, I say to her. You can love a lot of. Things about a person but still not love the whole person. Did you cry? Her question makes me laugh. No, I didn't cry. I was pissed. I get. Involved with these girls who claim they can handle it when I need to lock. Myself up for a week at a time. And when it actually happens, we spend the. Time we are together ding about how I love my art more than I love. Them. She turns and walks backwards so she can peg me with her stare. Do. You. Love your art more. I look straight at her this time. Absolutely. Her lips curl up into a hesitant grin, and I don't know why this answer. Pleases her. It disturbs most people. I should be able to love people more. Then I love to create, but so far that hasn't happened yet. What's the best anonymous confession you've ever received? We haven't been walking long. We aren't even to the end of the street. But the question she just asked could open up a conversation that could last. Four days. That's a tough one. Do you keep all of them? I nod. I've never thrown one away. Even the awful ones. Is gets her attention. Dean awful. I glance over my shoulder to the end of the street and look at my studio. I don't know why the thought to show her even crosses my mind, because. I've never shared the confessions with anyone. But she isn't just anyone. When I look at her again, her eyes are hopeful. I can show you some, I. Say. Her smile widens with my words, and she immediately stops heading in. The direction of her apartment in favor of my studio. Once upstairs, I open the door and let her cross the threshold that has, up. To this point, only been crossed by me. Is is the room I paint in. Is is. The room I keep the confessions in. Is is the room that is the most private. Part of me. In a way, I guess you could say this room holds my confession. Here are several paintings in here I've never shown anyone. Paintings. That will never see the light of day like the one she's looking at right now. She touches the canvas and runs her engers over the face of the man in. The picture. She traces his eyes, his nose, his lips. Is isn't a confession. She says, reading the piece of paper attached to it. She glances at me. Who. Is this. I walk to where she is and stare at the picture with her. My father. She gasps quietly, running her engers over the words written on the slip. A paper. What does nothing but blues mean? Her engers are now trailing over the sharp white lines in the painting. And I wonder if anyone has ever told her that artists don't like it when you. Touch their paintings. That's not true in this case, because I want to watch her touch every. Single one of them. I love how she can't seem to look at one without feeling. It with both her eyes and her hands. She looks up at me expectantly, waiting. For me to explain what the title of this one means. It means nothing but lies. I walk away before she can see the. Expression on my face. I lift the three boxes I keep in the corner and take. Them to the center of the room. I take a seat on the concrete or end. Motion for her to do the same. She sits cross-legged in front of me with the boxes stacked between us. I. Take the two smaller boxes off the top and set them aside, then open the lid. On the larger box. She peeks inside and shoves her hand into the pile of. Confessions, pulling out a random one. She reads it out loud. I've lost over 100 pounds in the past year. Everyone thinks it's. 
because I've discovered a new healthy way of living, but really it's because I suffer from depression and anxiety and I don't want anyone to know. She places the confession back in the box and grabs another. Will you ever use any of these for paintings? Is that why you keep them in here? I shake my head. Is is where I keep the ones I've seen in one form or another before. People's secrets are a lot alike, surprisingly. She reads another. I hate animals. Sometimes when my husband brings home a new puppy for our children, I'll wait a few days and then drop it off. Miles from our house. And I pretend it ran away. She frowns at that confession. Jesus, she says, picking up several more. How do you retain faith in humanity after reading these every day? Easy, I say. It actually makes me appreciate people more, knowing we all have this amazing ability to put on a front. Especially to those closest to us. She stops reading the confession in her hands and her eyes meet mine. You're amazed that people can lie so well. I shake my head. No. Just relieved to know that everyone does it. Makes. Me feel like maybe my life isn't as fucked up as I thought it was. She regards me with a quiet smile and continues sifting through the box. I watch her. Some of the confessions make her laugh. Some make her. Frown. Some make her wish she'd never read them. What's the worst one you've ever received? I knew this was coming. I almost wish I had lied to her and said I throw a lot of them away, but instead I point to the smaller box. She leans forward and touches it, but she doesn't pull it toward her. What's in here? He confessions I never want to read again. She looks down at the box and slowly pulls the lid off of it. She grabs one of the confessions from the top. My father has been. Her voice grows weak and she looks up at me with daunting sadness. I can see the gentle roll of her throat as she swallows and then looks back down to the confession. My father has been having sex with me since I was eight years old. I'm 33 now and married with children of my own, but I'm still too scared to say no to him. She doesn't just place this confession back into the box. She crumples it up into a tight ST and she throws the confession at the box, like she's angry. At it. She puts the lid back on it and shoves the box several feet away. I can see that she hates that box as much as I do. Here, I say, handing her the box she hasn't opened. Read a couple of these. You'll feel better. She hesitantly removes one of the confessions. Before she reads it, she straightens up and stretches her back, and then inhales a deep breath. Every time I go out to eat, I secretly pay for someone's meal. I can't afford it, but I do it because it makes me feel good to imagine what that moment must be like for them, to know a complete stranger just did something nice for them with no expectations in return. She smiles, but she needs another good one. I sift through the box until I nd the one printed on blue construction paper. Read this one. It's my favorite. Every night after my son falls asleep, I hide a brand new toy in his room. Every morning when he wakes up and nds it, I pretend not to know how it got there. Because Christmas should come every day and I never want my son to stop believing in magic. She laughs and looks up at me appreciatively. At kid's gonna be sad. When he wakes up in his college dorm for the RST time and doesn't have a new toy. She places it back in the box and continues sifting through them. Are any of these your own? No. I've never written one. She looks at me in shock. Never. I shake my head and she tilts hers in confusion. That's not right. Owen. She immediately stands and leaves the room. I'm confused as to what's going on, 
but before I take the time to stand up and follow her, she returns. Here, she says, handing me a sheet of paper and a pen. Sitting back down on the oar in front of me, she nods her head at the paper and encourages me to write. I look down at the paper when I hear her say, write something about yourself that no one else knows. Something you've never told anyone. I smile when she says this, because there is so much I could tell her. So much that she probably wouldn't even believe, and so much I'm not even sure I want her to know. Here. I tear the paper in half and hand a piece of it to her. You have to write one, two. I write mine RST, but as soon as I'm done, she takes the pen from me. She writes hers without hesitation. She folds it and begins to throw it in the box, but I stop her. We have to trade. She immediately shakes her head. You aren't reading mine, she says. RMLY. She's so adamant, it makes me want to read it even more. It's not a confession if no one reads it. It's just an unshared secret. She shoves her hand inside the box and releases her confession into the pile of other confessions. You don't have to read it in front of me in order for it to be considered a confession. She grabs the paper out of my hands and shoves it into the box along with hers and all the others. You don't read any of the others as soon as they write them. She makes a good point, but I'm extremely disappointed that I don't know what she just wrote down. I want to pour the box out onto the oar and sift through the confessions until I end hers, but she stands up and reaches down for my hand. Walk me home, Owen. It's getting late. We walk most of the way to her apartment in complete silence. Not an uncomfortable silence in any way. I think we're both quiet because neither of us is ready to say goodbye just yet. She doesn't pause when we reach her apartment building in order to say goodbye to me. She keeps walking, expecting that I'll follow her. I do. I follow behind her, all the way to apartment 1408. I stare at the pewter number plaque on her door, and I want to ask her if she's ever seen the horror movie 1408, with John Cusack. But I'm afraid if she's never heard of it, she might not like that there's a horror movie with the same name as her apartment number. She inserts her key into the lock and pushes open the door. After it's open she turns around to face me, but not before motioning toward the apartment number. Eerie, huh? You ever seen the movie? I nod. I wasn't going to bring it up. She glances at the number and sighs. I found my roommate online, so. She already lived here. Believe it or not, Emery had a choice between three apartments and actually chose this one because of the creepy correlation to the movie. That's a little disturbing. She nods and inhales a breath. She's different. She looks down at her feet. I inhale and look up at the ceiling. Our eyes meet in the middle, and I hate this moment. I hate it because I'm not Nish talking to her, but it's time for her to go. It's way too soon for a kiss, but the discomfort of an RST date coming to an end is there. I hate this moment because I can feel how uncomfortable she is as she waits for me to tell her good night. Rather than do the expected, I point inside her apartment. Mind if I use your restroom before I head back? That's platonic enough but still gives me an excuse to talk to her a little more. She glances inside, and I see a ash of doubt cross her face because she doesn't know me, and she doesn't know that I would never hurt her, and she wants to do the right thing and protect herself. I like that. It makes me worry a little less, knowing she has a semblance of self-preservation. I smile innocently. 
I already promised I wouldn't torture, rape, or kill. You. I don't know why this makes her feel better, but she laughs. Well, since. You promised, she says, holding the door open wider, allowing me inside. Her apartment. But just in case, you should know I'm very loud. I can. Scream like Jamie Lee Curtis. I shouldn't be thinking about what she sounds like when she's loud. But. She brought it up. She points me in the direction of her restroom, and I walk inside, closing. The door behind me. I grip the edges of her sink while looking in the mirror. I try to tell myself again that this is nothing more than a coincidence. Her. Showing up at my doorstep tonight. Her connecting with my art. Her. Having the same middle name as I do. At could be fate, you know.